Hello and welcome to Take Time, I'm your host Patrick Marlette, and let's talk vintage watches. Now by commenter request, there was a few of you that asked me about this particular watch in the message board and comments, uh, so Mr. B in particular, this one is for you. Today we're going to talk about one of my personal favorite chronographs from what is definitely my favorite watch brand, and that is the Seiko 6139-6000. Now, there are actually a few different references from the 6000 series, that being the 6139 6000, 6001, 6002, 6005, 6007, and 6009. Now, those numbers just distinguish which markets they were intended for, and the 6005 and 6009, like this one here, were actually intended for the American market. So this is an American 6 now before I go over the review and give you my personal thoughts on the watch, I want to give you a little bit of a historical overview of this timepiece. It's, it's very important in the world of chronographs, and uh, I, I normally don't do historical overviews, but I think it's essential for this piece. Now I want you guys to know a lot of the information I'm going to be telling you today I actually found out on the springbar. Dot com. They did a great collector's guide and overview of the 6139-6000 series chronographs that I will share a link of in the description. It's really phenomenal. I'm, like, I'm going to touch on maybe 15% of what their article was. Uh, the whole thing is great if you want to learn more about this beyond what I touch on today. Now this watch represents a world of first for the Seiko brand. It's actually one of the first ever automatic chronographs, and it established this in May of 1969. You see, back in the late 1960s, there were three groups competing to make the first automatic chronograph. Back then, it was a big honor to come up with these mechanical achievements, and the whole world was watching. Now, the honor for the first ever automatic chronograph really does belong to Zenith, as they produced a model back in January of 1969 called the El Primero otherwise known as the first. Then there was the Chronomatic Group, which was consistent of Hoyer Leonidas, Breitling, and Hamilton Buren. Now, that actually deserves its own video, the Chronomatic Group. It was very, very interesting at the time that three major companies would pair together to work on a singular project, that being the Caliber 11 chronograph, but I, I won't delve too far into that. But that group showed off several pre-production samples of their watch at the Basel Fair of April 1969. However, the first serial production model automatic chronographs for the open market were made in Japan, and those were the Speed Timer 6139 variants, with production dates as early as March 1969. The next major first for this lovely watch is the fact that it was actually the first automatic chronograph in space. <laughs> I didn't know that either. And in fact, the world didn't know it until about 2007. Now, the honor for the first automatic chronograph in space actually belonged to a Zin 140. It was worn by German astronaut Reinhard Fur on Space Lab D1 mission in 1985. And you're actually seeing his image right now. He's the gentleman at the top right. As I mentioned, it was only later discovered back in 2007 that Colonel Pogue wore a 6139-6002, not too unlike this watch, during his NASA Skylab 4 mission, which took place in 1973. That's 12 years prior. Now, on the Pogue note, th these 6139-6000 series watches are commonly referred to as the Pogue, and as you can tell by that little story, it actually gets that denotion from Colonel Pogue himself. It's important to note that not every one of these is a Pogue. A blue dial is not a Pogue. A silver dial is not a Pogue. Not even a yellow dial is necessarily a Pogue. A true Pogue has the text water 70 meter resist on the dial over by the nine o'clock indice, replacing it, and it will also say water resist on the back. If you want to learn more about Vintage Seiko, I'll encourage you to check out Spencer Klein's channel. He's here on YouTube as well. I learned that little tidbit of information from him. He focuses solely on Vintage Seiko, so if that's your thing, then do check him out. Now the next and last interesting note I'd like to bring up about this watch is actually right on the face. So while the debate is out on whether Seiko was the first to do this and not Rolex, this particular watch features a detail 
found in other Seikos of the time, and that is the Pepsi bezel. And if you have a theory or a definitive answer on who was the first to come out with a Pepsi bezel for a watch, uh, let me know in the comments down below. However, this watch hyper popularized the Pepsi bezel look, and as a matter of fact, every 6139 after the speed time reversion featured one of these tachometer outer Pepsi bezels. That was a lot more history than I'm used to handling on this show. I hope I delivered it in a concise way. Now let me get to some of my personal thoughts on this watch. Guys, uh, I, I absolutely hated this design initially. I'm not gonna lie. The 6139 6000 series just didn't appeal to me at all. Like, I, I knew they existed, I'd seen them, I thought the honey yellow dial was cool, but I didn't think much of it. It was only after a lot of eBay surfing that I, I found a ridiculous deal on one of these come up. One from the original owner, um, whose name is actually on the back of this watch. It was a gift to him and uh, he just didn't wear it, and I wound up picking it up. And as you can read from the inscription on the case back, this was actually gifted to a Charles G. Wimberly. I love, I absolutely love little details like this on, on vintage pieces, and you know, these, these things aren't for everyone, but pieces that have just a little bit more heritage baked into them already are, are very cool to own. Um, that, that's one of the allures, at least for me, when it comes to vintage watches, and something I feel like I should bring up. Another thing I should bring up about vintage watches is that they often come with what watch enthusiasts call wabi. And wabi just refers to the imperfections of a watch. That is to say, any nicks or scratches or wear and tear from general use. Um, and this one amazingly does not exhibit that much wabi, just a little bit. Because if you look closely, you can still see the radial finishing of the brush strokes on the top of the case. And what was once high polished lugs and just this broad slab of steel on the side, also high polished, and another edge that greets the wrist, high polished. And like I was saying earlier, I, you know, I never really liked the 6139 case design until I got it in hand. At first I thought, you know, I'd get this as a collector, maybe turn it down the road, because it was such a fine example of a 6005, but after owning it and wearing it, I, I became absolutely obsessed, and this is actually what started me on the track of collecting vintage Seikos. I'm gonna take a moment to point out some of the key features of this 6000 series chronograph, um, the things that make it really special. Now I mentioned earlier, but this watch actually came in three specific dial face arrangements and not including the speed timer variant. There was a midnight blue, silver, and this just gorgeous honey yellow. And I'd love for anyone to point out a modern watch with just as much character as this. You're not gonna find it. But while we're talking about some of the features, You'll notice that there is a tacky scale on the outside and what looks like a chapter ring on the inside. But in fact, this is actually an indicator ring. It's a separate way to graph time. And you actually adjust it in the zero position, that is the crown at rest, just by moving it around. Turning it counterclockwise moves it clockwise and turning it clockwise moves it in reverse. It's just that simple. There's only one position on the crown here, and that is out to adjust the time. And in this first position, you can actually move it past midnight and have the date and day change. Uh, and they, they change just perfectly. And as you notice there, there was actually the date in Spanish. And what I love about this, and it's not a true quick set date, there isn't a position to allow you to move the day and the date, but it has a much more intuitive system. And a lot of people I feel don't know about this, and, and I, I want to share that information with you today. I had to look up um, this old manual I found online. Uh, so there's some service papers, I forget off what website, but I found some service papers in regards to the kind of oils you should use to loop up this chronograph and, and how the different crown positions work. Anyways, to set the day and the date on this watch, to adjust the date, you push it in slightly. To adjust the day and the date, you push it in just a little bit more. And if you hold it in this position, you can keep on adjusting the day while remaining at the same date. It's a really hard mechanism to get used to, 
but with enough practice, you'll figure it out. Now, I'm not gonna go ahead and actuate the chronograph. Um, as I mentioned, this was a one owner watch and I'm pretty sure he never had it serviced. Although the time is accurate, the pushers are very stiff. And one of the issues with this particular piece, and I'll share what I know about it with you guys, is that from my research, a lot of mechanics have a common problem with these pushers, and that is they take in a lot of dirt and grime. So if I were to pull these pushers out, you'd see just a lot of grime and nastiness built up from years of use. And unfortunately, that's just one of the issues with this case design. Take it or leave it, it's, it's there. So if you were interested in buying a 6139 6000 series watch, that's one of the issues you should be aware of. Servicing you may find might be difficult on this. I, I don't think every watch mechanic would know how to operate and work on a 6139 movement. However, cleaning up the watch and taking care of its aesthetic quality is actually quite easy. If you had a case back removal tool, you would be able to pop off the back here. They use a movement retainer ring that holds these pushers in place. And I'm actually gonna take the time later to remove the movement, clean out the crystal, perhaps replace it and clean out the pushers while I'm at it. And that's the thing with vintage, you know, it requires just a little bit more love than a modern watch, but if you're willing to put in the time, it's not that big of an issue. And what's great about this is that they range from about $300 to $400 on average. And, and to me, honestly, that's, that's not that much. Like, there aren't that many modern watches that look this nice. As a matter of fact, I can't think of a single modern chronograph that's this cool, that's just this funky. I mean, I absolutely love this design. It's stellar, there's, there's nothing on the market quite like it. And if you luck out like I did, you just get these classic Seiko case lines. Now these are the original case lines for the watch and you can actually see how it transitions along the back. You know, that's what the tip of the lug should look like. That's what the sides of the case should look like. You know, I, I, I really did luck out. So guys, you know, I'm gonna just hold the watch up here. If you're looking for a good example of this piece, you know, this is what one should look like. You know, there are a lot of faux 6139s on the market. Just be wary of them. Many of them come out of the Philippines. Uh, it's unfortunate to say that as I'm a Filipino, but that's just the case. Guys, I, I don't have too much more to say about this piece. I mean, I'm absolutely in love with it. Uh, so what I will do is leave you with a wrist shot so you have an idea of what it would look like on your wrist. Now here's what the watch will look like for all of your admirers. And when you are going to admire it, it looks a little something like this. The case measures 48 millimeters from lug to lug. At its furthest points, it's 42 millimeters across, including the crown, which juts out ever so slightly. And while I'm talking about this, guys, there are actually earlier versions of this watch from 69 to about 71 that have a notch in the case right there where the crown is. Those are highly collectible. If you see one and it's under $300, buy it. Check the case lines, but then buy it. And it is about a 13 millimeter case height, so not that bad at all, not too shabby for, you know, the world's first ever automatic chronograph, kind of. And then you have a 19 millimeter lug width. So a little obscure, but it, it is actually in the ballpark for most Seikos of that era. I mean, all the Seikos I own from the 70s, late 60s have 19 millimeter lug widths. It was just a common thing. Gang, I am happily wearing two Seikos right now, a vintage masterpiece and a modern oddity. I cannot wait to do the review on this. But if you enjoyed the review of my 6139 chronograph, please leave a like. If you have watched friends, forums, or groups, and you found this video insightful, I am going to encourage you to share it with them. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, what's wrong with you? The subscribe button is right there. You could subscribe by clicking my logo that's on the screen right about here, or you can hit the subscribe button. That's why it's there. Again, my name is Patrick Marlette, and thank you for the time.